Hello, and a very warm welcome once again to the Change Exchange. My guest for this session, Jenny Morris. Hi, Cook Rita. par excellence, <laughs> writer of half a dozen cookbooks. Yes, I'm busy on number six. <laughs> has a, a restaurant in Cape Town called Yamshus, runs a cookery school, yeah. has done radio for the past 20 years. There's nothing Jenny hasn't done in food. And you say that your first influence was your parents' vegetable garden. Yeah, absolutely. I always, people say, you know, uh, where did it all start? And it did start from there. I, I always say I was not born in there, but uh, my <laughs> mom could have dropped me there because she spent so much time gardening. But um, I grew up in a veggie garden. Um, she would, I learned to count, I learned colours from the garden. She'd say, go and pick six carrots for supper or, you know, go and get yes. me so many spring onions. And it was lovely to have that lovely fresh stuff just plucked from the earth. It was, yeah. So your mother cooked? She cooked. She, my mom was a with very great joy. She cooked with joy and she cooked with passion, but she wasn't an adventurous cook like my father. He was a messy one, uh, but he would cook really delicious, adventurous food, you know. Mm -hmm. So she was she cooked the sustenance and the nurturing dishes and he made a mess, delicious mess. <laughs> <laughs> and the first time someone paid for something you made was when you were still at school. You know, I used to cook for, uh, we used to have fundraising at school and I, if I do something, I do it big. Look at the size of me. <laughs> and um, each class would get a chance to do fundraising and I used to feed the teachers in the staff room. I used to make sandwiches and they used to love my mock crayfish sardines. It was the monkfish and they would take orders and um, I raised lots and lots of money for that school. <laughs> and yet when you left school, you first became a phone technician. That was only because my father didn't think that chefing was a dignified ladylike job. And unfortunately, you need funds from your parents to do any kind of studying. And I thought, I'll show you what's not dignified and ladylike. And I applied to the post office. They had, I worked on construction. The actual position is called a TN5. And I was a telephone electrician. I would go back today and I would do it over and over and over. I loved it, absolutely loved it. Why? What about it? You know what I loved about it was um, I loved, I like, I'm a nurturer. So I like taking things from the ground up. And if you look at that, um, if you look at the studio, it's a big vast room and that's what you would move into an exchange with this big room. We would pull these huge ginormous racks, get them bolted to the ground, big barrels of cable and you would stand there with two pieces of mutton cloth and you would be pulling it and cleaning it, bringing it all the way up the rack, all the way down. I love skinning the wires. I love paring them off. And it was better than the boys when I never had one dry joint when I soldered those wires to that little tag. I, I just, I loved it. And I really, really would do that again. So why did you leave? Because it's not a lady's job. <laughs> but at that point in time, there were quite a few girls doing it. A woman, I'm doing it. There were, with a Nancy and Bibby, I can, Irene, there were a couple of girls, Bernie, a mad one, we used to ride motorbikes in the exchange, had wonderful fun, but it, that wasn't my calling, you know, I wanted to cook, and um, as much, I mean, my father's shock and horror when I came home with a toolbox, he thought it was a gift for him, and I said, no, it's mine, and he thought, yeah, you've got a sense of humour, you're pulling my leg, I said, it really is mine, and he opened it, there was a long nose pliers, wire cutters, a big roll of solder, soldering iron, screwdrivers, and when I told him, he, he was mortified and horrified that a lady would do, because in those days, when women didn't do that kind of thing. So um, I would have stayed. I most probably could have gone on to do power or something like that. I had a Canadian um, chief tech. He, he was on power. That's where you like, connect everything and you can kill yourself if you touch those buzz bars. But I wanted to cook, you know and uh, we would even make food on a Friday, all the girls, and we would take money from the boys and we'd all compete with our different dishes. It's in my blood. And yeah. so how did you get into that thing? How did I get into that? It started with friends, you know, cooking for friends. I actually went into the hotel trade first. Um, once I left there, because a friend of mine said, you know what, um, I know your dad doesn't want to spend money on sort of training you, but Go to the hotels and tell them you want to do, you want to be a manager. And what will happen is you will go and you will do all the different, you'll do front of house, back of house, housekeeping, they'll put you in the kitchen, they'll put you in the bar. If there's an off sales, it'll happen. Um, and then eventually you'll be this fully rounded, which is when you get to the kitchen, stay. And I have a man that I always say thank you to. His name is Lee Hall. 
and he um, used to manage the Los Angeles Hotel um, in Musgrave Road in Durban. And he allowed me to come on board and do this thing. And I really did stop once I was in the kitchen and it, I wasn't welcome in that kitchen because I had all these huge, big, burly men. There were no women with these big steaming pots. To me, I'd, I hate food like that because it's like just clap everything in the pot and cook it, you know. And I said to him, we have this ladies bar, the King Cotton. You have such potential. Why are you not selling lunches? Every day you could have a different, lovely, refined food in here. And he said, well, how on earth are you going to get that right? I said, give me the opportunity. He says, if you can get those ones in the kitchen to listen to you, then I would. Then, then you can do it. And I made him get me a CB radio and put a huge big aerial on top of the hotel. And I, my, my, uh, <laughs> my um, CB name was Love Child. But no one ever knew it was me, Rudder. And I would say, okay, we're having this and that and that and that at King Cotton. Everybody would come and Love Child was never, ever there, you know, because they never knew it was me. But to get those chefs in the kitchen to allow me um, to do what I did, I would go and say, oh, this smells so delicious in here. Can I have a taste? And it wasn't. It was like really... Corsair's is course. Corsair's is course. And I'd say, oh, this is so nice. But what would happen if you added this or put this or put this? And they would say, Hamba Kosazan, and kick me out of the kitchen. Next day, they would say, Izapa Kosazan, and call me. They'd done it. Maybe I have a way with men in pots, I don't know. <laughs> they started changing the food. So Lee Hall gave me that wonderful opportunity, you know, so every day and there would be a fish on this day and a curry day and an Italian day and a la 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 la. And I knew then that now I, I, I can never go back. I have to go forward. So it started with that. Um, and then I moved to Cape Town to be with my husband my second husband and um, well I suppose the rest is history <laughs> I ran up the electricity bill all that water friends would bring ingredients and I would cook for them basically and not charge and he said you've got to turn this into something viable <laughs> but the first time you um, shall I say pretended to be a caterer you weren't yet no <laughs> but someone asked and you just said yes I tell did. the story you know what a friend of mine said to me um, one of the friends that I used to cook for she said there's a kiosk going in St George's Mall um, would you cook for me so I said I don't know if I really want to commit to cooking you know every single day for someone I'll take a financial interest and she said okay we can be partners we went down we had a look at it it was very tiny it had a microwave and nothing so the man selling it said, I said, but who are you supplying here? So he said, no, we do BMW catering and we do this. And we do. I said, oh, really? So I'm not one to just take things on face value and on surface. I went to BMW and I said, you know, I believe that catering comes out of this kitchen. And they said, well, actually, it's only really pizza. Who are you? <laughs> I said, I'm a caterer. <laughs> and they said, oh, can we have your number? Have you got a card? I had nothing. I was nothing. And... Um, gave the number and literally three, four days later, they phoned and said, we've been let down and by our caterer. So I phoned my friend and I said, listen, do you want to be a caterer? And she couldn't cook, she could drive and she meticulously packed. She was a very good organizer. So she said, yeah, let's do it. And it's amazing. Um, I phoned back, I said, yes, I can do it, but I need time, you know, what's, how much time have I got? They said, well, we needed it, six. This was around about quarter to four and I thought, oh, you got, okay. Um, yes, we'll do it. We're 10 minutes late because Badenkrach Street and that traffic, as you know, is not very easy. And then... How many people? Days, uh, that was only for about 12 people. Oh. But still, it was lots of food. You see, I don't... I'm a... I, I never learn. I want lots of things. Instead of saying, oh, I'll give you three dishes, I'll give them like 20. So 10 days later, they said, could you do us a, um, a boardroom lunch? Which we did. And then um, they kept using us. And then the third job was um, an art exhibition for the Dutch embassy. And from that, um, it, just, it just grew. Um, Prince Charles came out of that. Or Sir David Wilcox first came Prince out of that. Prince Charles came out of that. Explain. Yes. Well, the, the British High Commissioner had happened to be a guest um, at that uh, function. And they called me in and said, uh, would you consider um, doing the... Sir David Wilcox, you know, it's his swan song, and we're having this thing at the... Was he the uh, Consulate General? Uh, oh, no, uh, um, it was Merv. Um, I can't remember her surname now. It was a lady high commissioner, but it was for the conductor, um, Sir David Wilcox. And he was in South Africa, and it was a lot of people. I was working out of my home kitchen with a little Bosch oven. I'm telling you, that oven cooked for... 
Prince Charles, it cooked for <laughs> Tabo, not Tabo and Becky. Yes, it did. It cooked for Tabo and Becky as well until I moved out and, and got professional kitchens. But just one thing just rolled on to the next. I mean, Kenneth Kahunda came. I treat them all the same. The money's the same, you know. Kenneth Kahunda was not easy to cook for, though. Why? Because I made this, he's vegetarian. And I made this beautiful, once again, Jenny goes big, this huge big platter with all kinds of the most delicious vegetarian food. I did Mediterranean, I did Burakos, I did African, I did everything on this platter. And the central part was these huge big mushrooms this size with the most delicious sauce ruder. And I even got porcupine quills, which let me tell you, I did sterilize because I know they can give you rabies. And I popped them in the middle and I took this and I was smiling and, I, and they looked at it and it, they could see the steam coming off it. And they said, you can't eat this food, it's too hot. <laughs> and I said, excuse me, put it in the freezer. I wanted to whack him. <laughs> I had to freeze that food, put it in the box freezer because he had some kind of tummy problem. He only ate cold food, like cold, and cold no food. And no one had told you? No, I was so disappointed. <laughs> but you have said that the, the most difficult for you, thing for you to overcome was always the feeling that you don't have a formal qualification. It's been the biggest drawback in my life. And it's only but it sounds as if you just stepped into the void every time. Can I tell you, Ruda, um, because I, I like challenges, Everybody wants that piece of paper. I'm not saying that children today shouldn't go to a chef school because I highly encourage it because there's so much more that you, you can learn there and then. It's taken me all those years to hone my skills. I mean, I sit on the board of the Hearst campus and I mark the children's exams. I never had lecturers. I had to go out and find out for myself and work alongside people, but nothing is impossible. Impossible becomes I'm possible. <laughs> Just give it a little, you know what I'm saying? I'm possible, but you always feel <gasps> that one's got a piece of paper and I don't. But I've analyzed it and I've realized how on earth do those kids learn? You take a recipe book, they're lucky because they've got someone showing them yes. physically how to do it, but theory is theory is theory. Mm. Do you know what I'm saying? So if you don't have money to go to a chef school, I would say to anyone out there that wants this career, go into a hotel like I did and wash dishes if you have to, you know. Don't let anything hold you back. And I, I think I've kind of slowly, slowly, my husband has, hasn't beaten it out of me because he wouldn't be allowed to tell the story, but he's knocked that nonsense out of my head. I'm as good as anyone else. I'm a judge. I judge food competitions around the world. I know what's good. <laughs> Other people seem to think so. How did you get onto television? Also, just by accident, you know, things just, isn't it strange how things come to you and you say to yourself, why me? You know, it's, it's weird. I think my first um, foray into television was uh, um, Tekalani Sesame was a children's show. And I took vegetables and made them look gorgeous and interesting because kids need, you know, children have to taste things seven times before they even decide if they really hate it. You've got to keep reintroducing it and I did things like little sweet potatoes turned and I called it a ho, ho and like the legs were beans and on the end of the bean were like little baked bean shoes you know that kind of thing so I think it started with that yes but how did how did you get in front of the camera like, who someone where did it they from? came I think seeing I don't know my food it's it's from the food and I, I've been told I have a personality <laughs> <laughs> I don't know <laughs> they just and I, I've always said no um, to that kind of thing and I think it started with that and I think if someone does see you on screen um, then they think that you are this person that does TV do you know what? how did you experience being in front of the camera for the first time I nearly died <laughs> I just pretended that everyone like the cameraman and the director had no clothes on and I had a good laugh at them in my head <laughs> I don't know I just I think I was very lucky that the crew, I think crew makes a big difference mm -hmm. um, too. They relaxed me and they said, it's fine, just be yourself. And I can't be anything but, I'm not an actress, you know, <laughs> I would never be an actress. And I just was Jenny. And then I think as you get into it, you forget where you are, you know. Yeah, you just focus on you the job. You just focus on one, what you're doing. Yeah. And then little interviews came and extra things. And then um, a lady called Susan Nell gave me, um, my first sort of 
series. It was advertorial with Robertson Spices. And um, it was with Bill Flynn. Oh, Bill, he was amazing to work mm. with. And it was a quiz show. And it was fantastic. And then there was 13 week, and then I did a thing with Yvonne Chaka Chaka. Uh, and we call, it was with Tastic Rice at the time, because a lot of these things are driven by mm. product. And that was called Murphy's Meals. And she was so delicious to we still great friends to this day. And it started with that type of thing. And then if you work with, I mean, you're gorgeous. I'm feeling so comfortable in your company, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? I don't feel yeah. intimidated. I feel very comfortable with mm. you. And it just went. And then this big break that I've got now with uh, Food Network came from, um, they were at a food show. My name had popped up with a couple of people They came and found me and they filmed me without me realizing what it was all about. And then the next minute I got a call. So you were doing an, an, an audition just, without knowing well, yeah, it. Yeah, I was just yeah. being genuine. Which is the best way. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> they got their hands full. <laughs> yeah. And okay. then you did, uh, was the first one, uh, what was it called? Jenny Morris, Jenny Cooks, Morris Morocco. Cooks Morocco. Yes, Jenny Why Morris. Why Morocco? Um, one of the other things that I do is, um, and this stems from my father-in-law, from my first marriage, Uncle Tony Esposito. Being involved in that Italian family made me have this wanderlust. I wanted to travel. I wanted to taste new things. How he taught old were me, you when you were married the first time? Oh, very young, <laughs> like 18. <laughs> but in those days, girls did that. You left school, you got a job, and then you got married, you know? So did this... But kick open the world for you. Well, it kicked open my vision yes. of what I thought the world was all about, you know, and it made me want to. Must remember, it was my first romance, my first boyfriend, and I married him. So I'd known Uncle Tony since I was the age of 11. So this man, spaghetti bolognese, and, and things that he would, cremolata, and things that I never knew in my family, a caper, an artichoke, you know, he sort of opened that up for me. And... Um, as I got older, I started to travel, and when you travel, you have this confidence. And I thought, if I'm so loving all these beautiful flavors and these wonderful experiences, because I do good food tours from foot rubs to hair washes to living the life, you know, of the people, I thought other people would, I'm sure, enjoy this. And that's how the Jenny Morris tours began. And I've always wanted to go to Morocco, and I went to Morocco and loved it. So when they said, what country would you like to film first, I said, Morocco. <laughs> and it was amazing. I spoke to Nataniel the other day, yes. and he said the best moment was when there was a real budget. Yes. Did you experience that? Absolutely. <laughs> I, mean, I have to say that Food Network are so professional. They pull out all the stops. What I love about and them as a, oh, what you, not a station, but as a, what, do you, what would we call it? A them? platform. A platform, is that they... Um, they want things to be authentic, but they want their presenters to be happy. So they let you do things that you're comfortable with. And then they pull out all the stops to connect you with the right people on your crew. And I had the most amazing crew um, in Morocco. It was stunning. Six and a half weeks driving, 6,000 kilometers. It was hectic, but it was such fun. Yeah. Your first cookbook, you called, tell me? Rude Food, Nude Food and Good Food. <laughs> Why that? Was, what did you want to say? I wanted to put the publisher off <laughs> with the title. <laughs> I didn't have the confidence to write a cookbook. And when I started my first cooking school, um, I was overseas and my husband uh, got hold of me and he, I was taking people on a trip to Thailand, one of those tours. And he said, when you get back, um, you've got one week and you've got your first cooking class. And I was like, what are you talking about? He says, I've hired the domestic science kitchen at Jan van Riebeck High School, and you're going to start cooking. And people just came. Why did he do this? Because he said, I'm sick and tired of people saying, I want to cook with you at your <laughs> school. <laughs> He's that kind of man, just say it a few times, and he makes it happen. So what happened was, uh, one of the girls that came cooking there uh, was a publisher, and she was with Human and Rousseau. And she said, I really would like to do a cookbook with you. And I thought, oh. And I put it off and put it off. And eventually David said, you're being really stupid. You know what? You can. People love your food. Just translate what you're cooking into words. So when she eventually asked me again, hugged me, I said, I tell you what, I want to call this book Rude Food, Nude Food and Good Food. You go back to your office. If they say I can have that title, I'll do the book. Now, Rude Food, I like eating with my hands. So this is Rude Food. 
Um, nude food is when you take an ingredient, having grown up in a garden, I understand the flavors of just something that is just so fresh and beautiful. So it would be that ingredient and you just layer the flavors on top, but everything has its own. And when you bring it together in your mouth, you know, it's just so delicious. And uh, so it was rude, it was nude, and it was good. <laughs> Well, you hope people would enjoy your recipes and she came back and said yes and I thought oh human and Rousseau they're quite a conservative you know publishing house and then more rude food followed and what was it like holding holding the first copy in your I hand sobbed. I can still cry now thinking about it because you never know, think you're good enough I thought why would they want my book when there's so many authors out there you know sorry <laughs> I still, it's still so special. Jenny, but this, I think, is such a lesson for so many people that you, ostensibly, you have all this confidence, that's the, the personality you project, and yet inside, you, there's this insecurity I that you have to overcome all the time. I didn't have that piece of paper that mm. said I was a qualified chef, and that has held me back, and please God, I hope it doesn't hold other people back. You want to believe in yourself, you know, it's like, uh, sorry. <laughs> you want to say to, to young people who are insecure, maybe? Never give up, because you know what? I know people want to see that piece of paper. You'll get it eventually, but just work towards it. Keep getting that experience, because you know what? You can't pay for experience. You cannot pay for experience. I have chefs that come to me and work with me. I'm teaching them all the time. They've come out of school. How can you expect anybody to know everything at once? You know, so life is a learning curve. You're never too old to learn. Don't think that you're too clever and too smart. You're never too old to learn. You've been doing radio, live radio, for it's close on 20 years now. Yes. Uh, what do you want to do with your show? What is the... I'm yeah. a teacher. <laughs> I love sharing and, and I like to teach. I mean... Um, I was with Cape Talk Radio with Prime Media for 19 years, um, as long as the station has been open. In fact, I'm lying, two months short of 19 years with them. And it was the most happiest time of my life and I loved it. And they gave me carte blanche to do what I wanted. I like to impart information, I like to share. Um, I have recently um, left and I've gone to Heart Radio and I've got to, because I was given a bigger platform, 800,000 more listeners, um, Breakfast show, I mean, who would say no to that, you know? But once again, I haven't changed what I do because I did a show the other day where people were sort of coming on Facebook and on, on, on social media saying, but I didn't know that about a potato. I love it. Do you know when you can share something and when someone tells you something you don't know, you can add it to your repertoire. So for me, radio is a wonderful platform. It's to share. I do it very lightheartedly. I, I believe in edutainment, so I will educate um, light-heartedly and entertainingly and people love it I love it. it makes me comfortable and now you've opened a restaurant is this your first one yes uh, so I had the little coffee shop in the museum and then I had many many years break that said to me when I had the museum coffee shop I said never again I could never how can you work off a menu that is so boring <laughs> do you know what I'm saying and um, we had to relocate our cooking school It's called the cook's playground which is just opposite um, the uh, Cape Quarter. It was being, the building was being demolished and we needed somewhere to go. So we thought, why don't we buy a property? It's an investment in the future, things like that. Couldn't find anything that ticked all the boxes. Beautiful space, but it wasn't safe for ladies to come on their own at night. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm. It just, there was lots of empty boxes there that couldn't be ticked. So we thought, we love our landlord. I really do, I've got a wonderful landlord. Um, let's see if there's something. They didn't want us to, to lose us. They said, well, can we create a space for you? We, we took passages and turned it, you know, all that dead space into a cooking school. And while we were about it, the landlord said, well, we have this space over here. There was a restaurant here before. It hasn't done very well. It's been standing empty. How about it? And I nearly killed my husband. I said, I am not doing that. And he was like, why not? I said, because it will bore me to death. I don't want a 140 seater for goodness sake and I must work off this menu, I'll kill myself. And they'll come for something tonight and then want the same thing next week. Forget <laughs> it, I, they want the same, same, same. I said, but I tell you what, because I don't want arguments. If you give me a big fridge this, that my body can fit in twice and I can put anything I want in there and I'm not working at nights. So it was breakfast and lunch. 
then I'll consider it. And I'll have a very light menu on the side. Because you see, Why Rita, the big fridge? Because I want to put my dreams into that fridge. I dream food every night. I dream about food every night of my life. Take my cell phone out of my bag now and go and have a look on my one note. It's full of recipes. I wake up and I write. He drives him mad. He hears tuck, 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 tuck. <laughs> the, the, the phone shines in his face. I, and how many recipe books can you publish at once? So I have all these recipes and nowhere to go with them. Um, I can use some of the Cook's Playground with our team building. We do corporate team building there. Um, and we have lots of repeat customers. So I'm developing all the time so they don't get bored with it. But I have this arsenal of recipes and what can I do? So he said, okay. And it's, it was coming to the end of the year. We opened that restaurant in two weeks. I'm like a nutcase. And I said, if you don't get that fridge, we're not opening. He got those, and they said, we've closed our orders in October already. I said, we don't get the fridge, we don't have the restaurant. <laughs> we got the fridge. And we called it the kilo table. And we have a hot section and we have the fridge with everything. In, and it's absolutely overloaded with the most beautiful salads. And the whole thing about that, it's fresh. It's my garden that I grew up in. It's fresh, it's seasonal. We make just enough. And too bad if there isn't because I don't recycle food to the next day. And it will be different tomorrow. So don't... It'll be as different as my customers will allow me. This is the problem. Because our belly pork is the talk of the town. They love it. There are certain salads I will never be able to take out of that fridge ever again. But I keep adding to it. So those same people, they come, oh, you know, there's something different. Yesterday mm. was angelfish, now you've got soul. You know, so we change it up um, all the time. Um, how, like do you, how do you run... Uh, I almost want to say your life as a business because there are so many strands in it. Yeah. And in many cases, you need to be there personally on radio in front of a camera for television yes. shows and the cookery school and the restaurant. And you have children. I do, but they're big now. <laughs> but it's, it's time management, really. I mean, I've turned so much work away because I believe that if you can't do it properly, don't take it on because you can spoil and ruin everything. Can one delegate the kind of thing yes, you I do? Yes, I do. Not everything, because yeah. I'm such a control freak. But um, the cooking school, I've started to leave. I haven't left it alone, but I have delegated. I've got someone who knows this is my way, and this is the way I like it, and they do it. Um, at the restaurant, my staff know that don't be offended if I turn it and send it back to the kitchen and reject it, so they know exactly what I expect. I make them taste and eat everything <laughs> that is on that menu so that they know that this is what the taste is. Not all of us have the same taste bud or diet or background. Mm -hmm. And um, I will never forget the one young lady took the fish sauce and she was oh, throwing the fish sauce into the seaweed salad. And I thought, that's not going out because <laughs> I can see you. You know what fish is pungent, it's overpowering. So I just took them all in the kitchen and gave them a little plastic teaspoon. I said, da 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 now eat. <laughs> no, you have to eat. You have to learn the ingredient. They nearly died. But that never happened again. Do you see what I'm saying? Because they learn by example. <laughs> so they know what is acceptable and what is not. So I've been able to travel. Um, Lindsay, who's my future daughter-in-law, is just, I proposed to her. Uh, she's definitely who I want in my son's life. <laughs> And he loves and adores and they will get married. <laughs> but Lindsay left the world of finance to join the family business. Um, and ultimately the children will run that business. It's for them and I'll go on to the, <laughs> to the next thing. But she knows exactly what we expect, how it should be done. So I can delegate. I can. In that way. But I yeah. do poke my, I never stop. I mean, I cook. I was cooking this morning before coming out to meet with you. you so know. how did you put this family together? Where did the, uh, you were married briefly yes, when you yes. were young? I was young. I married my first child with a sweetheart. Um, and then um, David, who's my current husband of 33 years, I have two sons with him. But how did you and he met, meet? And how did at you that decide very that- very same hotel. How did you decide that he was the right one? I didn't at the, at the time. I didn't even like him. <laughs> But How did he convince you? Um, I don't know. It just happened. You know, I, I think love grows out of friendship. Mm. It really does. I think if you like someone, you can so easily fall in love with them. And I think you need to like the person you're in love with. Because as you get older, everything else goes out the window. You know, and if you don't have friendship, what? 
are you going to talk about? <laughs> so I met him at the Los Angeles Hotel. Um, his business is electronics. And, um, he was, and he was an importer of sound and lighting. And he actually revolutionized the discotheque um, industry. industry in <laughs> South Africa because he worked overseas for many years, brought back Light Lab and all kinds of different things. I don't know if you remember in Johannesburg, there was a club called Q's, it was a supper club. And he built that and he put in, in those days in 1982, like 700,000 rands worth of equipment. Can you imagine what that is today? And um, he was busy fitting out some of the places there and we just would eat that horrible food. <laughs> At supper time when all the staff got around a table, I liked him as a person. I met him again another year after my divorce, funnily enough. So he wasn't the reason for my divorce. Um, met him a year later um, when I was poached by an ex-boss at a hotel and he said, oh, this is David Morris, I mean, he's putting in Ruby Tuesday at this club. I like, I said, I know him. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we all, the staff got together one night, we invited him to join us and, and we just picked up, mm. you know, this friendship where it left off and it developed from there. And over the years, he has now become part of the business. He has, it's so funny because um, this, this business has grown, he's always been such a wonderful support. Um, and always interested in what I do and in supporting me. But this just has grown and flourished that he had to stop what he was doing and join me. <laughs> so it's our business, not my business, it's his family business. And the boys, you, you have two sons. I have three. three I sons. have one in um, the UK. Um, his name is Wade, um, he's 41, he's got a little girl, so I'm a grandmother. I have my first granddaughter, she's too bright as a, oh, she's like mm. a bright little star, that one. And then I have uh, Darren, who's the middle boy. He's in IT. And then I have Ryan, who does uh, medical and security. So, and we're a very close family. The kids actually like going out with us and being with us. Aren't I lucky? <laughs> yes, you are. But it's also what you put in is what you get out. Absolutely. And how did you manage it when they were little when and you were small, so busy? Well, you know, the thing is, once again, you need a good support system and their father the most wonderful daddy on earth was there, you know, and the children, funnily enough, they all can cook and they cook. Ryan, the youngest one, I mean, you must see that kid. I could phone him and say, make me a pasta dough or make me a bread dough. Should we have pizza tonight? I say, make the dough. You know, if he wants it, you make it. Um, make me a tart tartan. We've always brought them into the business. Um, Darren, who's my middle child, when we had the museum cafe, we work six seven days a week, we never had a day off, and we were invited to the Table of Unity, and I said, I can't go. What's the Table of Unity? Um, it, um, in the old days, we used to have it on Table Mountain, and then the money would go to, to charity. It was that long, that long table. And they said, no, please, we really want you up there, you know. And um, Darren said, Mommy, I can run the restaurant. He was 12 years old. <laughs> and I was like, he said, trust me, I can do it. I said, well, we're just up the road. We can always come down again. And that child ran that restaurant. For how long? For the whole day. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have expected more from yes. him. But what I'm saying is they've always been involved yes. in our business. No, to keep a, a restaurant going for a day yes. is a thing. It was a huge thing, you know. But they were always at work with us. Um, at the cooking school, Ryan never missed one radio show. Can you believe it? For all the years I was at Cape Talk until he was about 15. He came every single Saturday um, to the radio station. So they, it's not because we forced them, they wanted to be involved in what we did. And I think it's been good for them. I think it's been very good for them. I'm sure. And you've also lived in the same house for, what did you say, 31 uh, 30, or 32 years? 1984, yeah, 33 years, 33 years. What binds you to that house? I suppose it's the, it's the land. <laughs> It's everything around it. I need space. I mean, I could live in an apartment, I suppose. Is it big? Is it? It's, well, we've got six bedrooms. It didn't start off like that. It was only two bedrooms, but we sort of went up and we went down. So it's got six bedrooms, six bathrooms, and it's just the two of us now, and, and three cats and two dogs and two African greys. And a vegetable garden? Oh, yes, and fruit trees and flowers and, yeah. Where is it? It's in Tamborskloof, so it's, it's in a lovely position. And the kids sleep at home often. <laughs> come for supper and don't go, you know. So I think um, it's, it's being able to have that lovely garden. It's not as big as what I grew up with. And animals and, and for my, and my kids. And I like space, you know, I love space, so, yep. Sounds like a 
a happy, wonderful place to it live. It is a beautiful place to live in. You know what? I think everybody needs to own a home. It's an investment. If you don't have a pension, you can sell it. <laughs> Jenny, thank you so much. It was Aww. most pleasant. And thank all of you. the very, very best for you. Thank you very much. Until next time, goodbye.